Appreciate the opportunity to be here today and for coming back here is a little bit like coming back home for me. So Mike and really the entirety of the team here at K-State provided an opportunity for my wife and I to come down about 20 years ago now. So that was in 2000, the fall of 2000, I was in your chair and, uh, and uh, really was a great experience and so it's good to come back. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, U.S. Wine Health Improvement Plan that at its heart is as is defined here as an industry, state, and federal partnership. It's, this is part of a, a USDA-sponsored uh, pilot project initiative um, entitled uh, the development and, in, and demonstration of a U.S. Wine Health Improvement Plan that's modeled after the U.S. poultry and egg industry's longstanding uh, uh, national poultry improvement plan. Um, this is a, kind of the, the core team of investigators that we worked with across the four different Midwestern universities to kind of get this thing off the ground and then uh, some really good uh, staff that we've been able to attract to help us uh, push this forward and, and again uh, uh, see this as an expanding collaborative effort as we go forward. Um, uh, the primary objective of this endeavor is to stand up uh, what's called an ASF-CSF monitored certification that's really modeled after the NPIP's H5, H7, avian influenza monitor certification that's held by something north of 99% of all U.S. commercial poultry operations. Um, the aim of this endeavor is to establish a, a really a national, a national a playbook or a national uh, approach or strategy for a uniform set of, of common definitions and, and technical standards that center on prevention and a systematic approach for demonstrating evidence of freedom of disease outside of, of control areas. And the overarching purpose is really to enhance all three aspects of, of uh, foreign animal disease uh, uh, preparedness, prevention, response, and recovery, to reduce the, the uh, impact of recurring endemic diseases of high consequence through the advancement of sanitary standards that uh, mitigate disease spread to in between farms uh, and, and, and last but certainly not least, really to provide the U.S. pork industry stakeholders a first-hand experience in developing and implementing an, an NPIP-like uh, program that's really customized to meet the needs of the, the 21st century uh, pork industry. And, and should there be interest, uh, as, as the, uh, the operations and systems that are established over the course of the pilot, uh, should there be interest, that this, uh, this endeavor could uh, transition into an officially recognized uh, platform for addressing uh, swine health related issues of high consequence uh, over the course of time. And this, this, this effort got its, uh, its roots, uh, actually it was in the summer of 2018, the Swine Health Information Management Center sponsored a, a 12 month case study um, entitled, Is It Time for a, an NPIP like program for swine? And, and, and really what this was is, you know, I've worked at the lab now, I think it's almost been 13 years, and, you know, we've been an NPIP lab, as is the K-State lab, uh, you know, have been forever, but really uh, didn't know a lot about it other than just kind of conceptually. And I can tell everybody this is, by doing this case study, uh, uh, so I knew I didn't know much about it going into it, but after doing the case study, I knew, I realized I didn't know anything about it. But I can tell you this, I didn't learn by reading the website, by reading the content, we, we, we learn by doing and by, by getting engaged at their meeting, visiting with stakeholders across the country and so on, and, and it was a, was a good experience. And in the end, it was the findings, the core, the core findings were that the findings suggest that the basic tenets and approach used by NPIP could serve as a practical roadmap for pork producers and slaughter facilities that are interested in more directly and systematically addressing the major swine health issues of high consequence and really better positioning the future of the U.S. pork indi industry, both the, the domestic and, and global marketplace. And so, just as a little bit of background on NPIP, it's a, it's a long-standing industry, state, and uh, uh, federal partnership that's really long played the central role at bettering the health of the U.S. poultry industries and the, and the competitiveness, both domestic and abroad. It serves to safeguard, certify, and represent the health of U.S. poultry um, uh, participation, of course, is voluntary, but essentially, un uh, essentially universal amongst commercial scale producers, and it's, it's, it's implemented across all segments of the U.S. poultry and egg industries and across all 50 states. It's got a long history, uh, dating back to the 1935, 
Um, these, uh, these core uh, health status classifications, they're the officially recognized standards for poultry health. They're, both, they're recognized both domestically and internationally, um, and they're used to demonstrate evidence of freedom of both trade and non-trade impacting diseases. And it's, like, as I mentioned earlier, is it's, its history dates back to 1935, okay? It was, it was, and it was originated uh, to eliminate a, a, a disease called pylorum disease, salmonella pylorum disease, which was causing people to get sick from eating uh, in, in, impacted eggs and, and poultry. We're getting sick from it. It says, well, we've got to work together to get this done. And so, but its origins were always on certifying breeding poultry, okay, breeding poultry, of being free of said uh, diseases, verti specifically vertically transmitted diseases. So it's like if you're buying their breeding stock and, and they, they confer, well, here's the status of that stock, well, everybody knew what they were talking about because it was common definitions and standards. Um, but then in 2004, uh, uh, this, this classification came into being, the NPIP H5H7 avian influenza monitor certification. And it was currently, was the first and still the only certification that applies to what they call commercial poultry, okay? Meaning meat type chicken, meat type turkey, and commercial egg layer. And the key driver of that was um, there was some both low path and high path avian influenza events of significance that were happening in different parts of the country that were co causing substantive disruption in both the interstate and international movement of product. Okay? And that was really the nidus for, for, the, for the poultry industry to pull this together and it really changed the complexity I would say of NPIP as a whole as it brought the entirety of the U.S. commercial poultry industry into it. Okay, and so what it does is it, it provides a system of ongoing surveillance. It advances biosecurity practices, again, that mitigate disease spread into and between farms, and provides an ongoing system uh, for providing evidence of freedom of disease uh, on an ongoing basis, when, on an ongoing basis, and in such times that there is a, either a low or high path event of significance in the, the U.S., this approach has been their primary tool to help uh, sustain ongoing interstate and international commerce in unaffected states and regions over the course of time. And I think above all, what it, what it is, it's a platform that brings industry, state, and federal partners together, specifically related to health, uh, health related issues, in their case poultry, in our case pigs, of high consequence in which there's, there's a need to, to do that, and, and it's, if you look at this model, that, that model looks a lot like the continuous improvement wheel, and that's really what it's about. It's not a one and done. It's an ongoing system for bringing these three, three segments together. And so we kicked that off really just this past summer. We had the, uh, the first um, Congress, okay, up here in the upper right-hand corner, and that's really the key is that it brings stakeholders together. In this case, the initial Congress, uh, there were 28 states that expressed interest. 27 of them showed up. We had over 200, where delegates were allocated to states, over 90% of the, the, the delegates that were allocated to the states were used. Um, so really just a tremendous turnout and engagement. Um, and really it's, it's that upper right hand corner that sets the tone, okay? That's the group that comes together to define program content, direction, and so on. And so I oh, brought that group together in Des Moines this summer to really kind of get this thing kicked off. Uh, very good engagement. Uh, the, the 28 states whose interests were represented uh, represent north of 99% of all the U.S. You know, domestic or commercial pig production in the U.S., so good engagement. And uh, uh, this was our survey that, that we took here after the session is, is this was really the kind of the kickoff and introduction of this endeavor to, to industry stakeholders. And I think that there was clearly a strong consensus of a recognition uh, and interest in seeing the need for such an endeavor. And so just a little bit about it, uh, the, this uh, pilot project, this ASF, CSF monitor certification, of course uh, participation be voluntary. The participants are the producers, the packers, the, the practicing veterinarians, diagnostic lab in both state and federal VMOs, uh, the certificate holders, um, which are made on an individual premises level, are the pork producers and the packing facilities. The uh, requirements for certification center on enrollment, 
uh, and meeting the requirements for certification that really center on maintaining a valid VCPR with an accredited veterinarian and then meeting such standards that center on biosecurity, uh, traceability, and disease surveillance. Um, uh, modeling this after the NPIP, uh, each state that elects to participate um, is responsible for standing up an official a U.S. ship, in this case, uh, a Swine Health Improvement Plan, a state agency. Their role is to administer the program to meet the needs of the participants in their state, uh, essentially maintaining the list of participants and their associated information and the ability to verify the participant status on an as-needed basis. Um, the participants' responsibilities are to enroll, uh, meet or exceed the requirements associated for the certification, and again, have the ability to maintain, a, a, to, the ability to verify compliance on an as-needed basis. As it relates to the overall system of governance and program administration and so on, essentially we're uh, very following the model, I'd say the time-tested model of, uh, that NPIP has, 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 has put forth, with the exception of during this pilot phase that our group of pilot investigators is playing the role that the cur currently that the USDA plays within within NPIP is serving as the essentially the program administrators, a general conference committee, which is we're using that as an advisory board. So with synergies of something that's called the National Swine Disease Council serve as our advisory committee with technical committees centering on biosecurity, traceability, disease surveillance, and of course the official Congress that comes together to determine program content and direction. As it relates to the funding of this endeavor, uh, what's been provided to date uh, is that the USDA came forward with this 500,000 uh, that stretches across the four different universities initially involved in standing this thing up over two years, and that's really to support the central startup of the endeavor, okay? Central startup of in the endeavor. It's the responsibility of each state that elects to participate to re be responsible for this, the, the, the cost of standing up their respective state agencies and the producer's responsibility uh, are associated with maintaining the, the, the meeting the requirements for certification. And so just a little bit of a history of the timeline overview of that. Uh, we really just started pulling this thing together in Q4 of 2020 um, and it kind of started pulling our team together, the collaboration together. And then in Q1, Q2 was really the forming stages of technical committees getting dot draft documents prepared for the, the inaugural House of Delegates that was this summer. And then as we're looking into Q4, the states are now in the process of determining what entity is going to be the official state agency within their respective state and how they're going to do that. And then uh, we'd look at engaging and initiating enrollment of participants in Q1 of 2022. Um, so just a little bit of the timeline. And as we look forward going into the second year, um, uh, oh, let me get here. It were really, there's two separate things here that's going on is one was is establishing the US, U.S. SHIP official state agencies. Again, with just no small, staff, no small task for the states, okay? When do you think the last time uh, we had a program disease affecting livestock that was being done in this, any sort of significant scalable way? Okay, it was pseudo, the eradication of pseudorabies, okay, which is now approaching 20 years ago from that, right? So now we're kind of getting this thing Okay, are we going to establish some systems to get that in place? How do we get that done and get that going? So, so a significant task there. And then, as Jordan mentioned earlier, um, there's a number of working groups that were established. So a number of resolutions that were passed at, the, at the, uh, this in inaugural House of Delegates that basically they said, we think uh, these are issues of high consequence and significance that need to be explored further. Okay, they're not going to be a standard going into year one, but something we need to dig into further. One of those was around topics of feed biosafety that Jordan mentioned. Uh, there's a number of other those around uh, biosecurity, disease surveillance, and sampling and testing. So a number of working groups and projects associated with that. That will, again, then lead forward to be reviewed and so on going forward with the, with the second House of Delegates next fall. And so a number of working groups and projects on issues of high consequence that center around Biosecurity, okay, this is the one that Jordan was mentioning about the K-State group looking forward to lead the feed biosafety related effort um, around traceability, okay, and around sampling and testing for disease systems for disease surveillance. And, um, and as we've got this going and we've got it out to the states, a lot of feedback from the states of, wow, who's going to do this work and how are we going to get this done? It's like, this is not insignificant to get, to get this thing off the ground. And so here a couple weeks ago, the end of October, 
um, the, uh, at the United States, what's called the USHA, USAHA, the United States Animal Health Association meeting, um, there was, a, as well as the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab meeting, that, that's a jointly held meeting, there was a resolution that came up through five different committees on both the USHA side and the AVLD side that, that, that passed. And, and basically what, it was, what, it, what the resolution was urging, uh, in, endorsing is for the, for the USDA to uh, expand the resources uh, being spent towards this endeavor, specifically to help get these states stand up their official state agency, as well as uh, help move some of these projects, these, these working group project-based initiatives, and some of those which are gonna cost some money to do, as well as any sort of diagnostics that will go along with this thing. And it really targeted this, the, 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 the funds that Cassie mentioned earlier in her presentation. And, and the, the core of that funding was, was the, how that originated was really centered around the Caribbean and what's, what's emerged in the Dominican and saying, you know, is there some small portion of that funding that could really be used to help get this thing going in earnest? And uh, so that's really what I think uh, what we're trying to get done here is we're really trying to say, um, see this as an opportunity, and I think I can say here on the bottom of the slide is really a pathway uh, for making, making tangible progress in what I would consider operationalizing preparedness energies uh, across, the, across the industry. So with that, I'll uh, be quiet and be glad to take any questions. Yeah, we have time for a few questions for Roger. Right, so it's a great question. So when we took this uh, forward, see, the question was is I don't see FMD up there, okay? So when we took this forward uh, initially, it was gonna be centered on ASF, okay? Just with the emerging threats to the, the pork industry associated with ASF. And, but the, the streams, the samples and so on and so forth and the clinical presentation crossover uh, in all USDA associated surveillance programs, ASF and CSF are together. Okay, and so it was really their idea to say, well, let's do those two together. But the, the platform and system of operations that you can see here, they're really agnostic to pathogen, right? Things around biosecurity, traceability, disease surveillance, and then this system of working operations, agnostic to pathogens. And so that, but that's why we, we started with the ASF and CSF. And, we, and another common question that, that came up, say, well, why, why did you start this, or, you know, about a disease we don't have? Okay, why did you do that? Okay, because, you know, you could have something like this centered on, on an endemic disease. But the reason why is because of the, the, uh, the economic consequence to the industry as a whole. Because it's about trade. Do you have a system to demonstrate evidence of freedom to help support trade? Okay, of bringing all segments of the industry together. Producers, large and small, packers, and industry and state federal partners. That's really what this is about. Um, so, great question. Mike. Roger, in the poultry industry, when they, when they moved, switched that in 2004, you said, how long did it take them to get the whole industry on board like they are today? Uh, I think it was pretty quick, of course. Yeah, the question was, when they brought forward the H5, H7, and brought the, 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 uh, the whole commercial industry on board, how long did it take them? The thing, the thing was, it was, it was impacting their market now. It was in, impacting bird movement, it was impacting trade now, and they needed to, there was, so that was the nidus, and they, you know, it's like anything else, is like, to the commercial side of the industry, they knew about NPIP, they respected what it did for their, their deal, but for the commercial side, they weren't, because it was mainly a breeder thing, and so it was new and different, but because I would say is because it was impacting commerce today, you know, the adoption rate to move it forward was very straightforward. And it's very, this stuff is, uh, you know, up in this upper right-hand corner, this is an everybody, this is an everybody program. It's not, well, just for these elite, you know, this is an everybody program. And uh, again, producers large and small, processors large and small. And uh, for things where you need to be able to represent the st health status across states and regions, you need it to be an everybody program. Okay. Question for Roger. 
A question I have, so a lot of producers in the room, we start talking about, you know, in 2022, producers could, you know, the timeline is to start to be involved or start that process. How do you, what do you see that process looking like if a producer, you know, as everybody learns more about this, this sure. could be the first time a lot of people have seen it or they know yeah. about it, but in terms of this detail, what is the, at least the plan now for a producer to be involved? What does that look like with steps they have to sure. do? Sure. So it would be, uh, it's producer by producer, packer by packer, state by state. Okay, and the enrollment and engagement is state by state. Okay, so I don't know if Dr. Smith is here or not. Oh, there he is. And so, I, and I believe in Kansas that the the, the plan the plan is that the KDA, I believe, is planning to be the is the is the official state agency. That's correct. And so it would be discussion with. KDA, and because they're going to come out with the producer association, so I'm sure the Kansas Pork Producer Association, then is in discussions with KDA to say, how are we going to do this in Kansas? Okay, how are we going to do this in Kansas? Because one thing we found out with the, the NPIP thing for sure when we did the case study, it's like each, it's a national program with common standards, but how each state goes about doing it, uh, there's a lot of approach, you know, state by state, because nobody understands their producers better than as you get closer to it. And so that, that it would be a discussion with your producer association and uh, the KDA about how are they going to do it in Kansas. So is the, is, the paper, is the paperwork requirement, the verifications about security, is that a uniform across states and then it's with, in the states how that gets pulled together? Right. So the, that's correct. Meaning common standards, right. but just the approach to how it's, say, implemented and ex executed and administered, yep. you might say, yep. will be, be state by state. Yep. Okay. Great. Any other last questions? Lisa. So, Roger, help me out with the, the verbiage or the salesmanship that I'm going to need when I go to the farm and I'm already saying, okay, you have to do PQA, you have to do common spine industry. Right, right. One more thing, type of thing. And I, I think the, the, the thing I you know, would say with this is, this is an effort to, in the end it's about, do you have a system to support trade or not? Okay? And of course we have systems that say support could support regionalization, so on like this, so on and so forth like this. But it's been an awful long time since we had a disease where we have to contain, eliminate, and demonstrate freedom. And the thing, Lisa, that attracted us about doing this is, is an approach for bringing all these players together, okay, all segments of the industry, state and federal partners, to be in, to be in a position to say, um, what I would say, defend, okay, defend and support a proactively a mechanism that's going to be able to sustainably demonstrate evidence of freedom of disease so you have the opportunity should you have an, any sort of an introduction to continue to move animals within and across state lines and to be able to demonstrate evidence of freedom across your supply chain area, areas and regions so you can trade this and you need to be able to say in the end do you have common standards that states can agree to and the USDA supports. And I think that, that ultimately that USDA shield on it is a really a, a, a necessary and important component for it to have recognition, if that makes some sense. But trade, at, at its heart, it's trade. Correct, correct, correct. So as it relates to existing, it's like I would say synergistic and complementary to, and there's certainly nothing in this endeavor that we would say is associated with recreating the wheel. Okay? Steve.
Right. You know, I, I think the, the, the question was about what, you know, is the, what's the stick, right? I think the, uh, my sense would be that uh, both producers, okay, and packers um, have a common interest in wanting to be able to be viable, right? And being able to be viable, have a, have a productive business, and a, a be able to sustain and advance uh, their businesses. And both interstate movement of animals and international movement of product is a very co critical component into the industry that we have today, okay? And so I think ultimately that there's no question that a critical mass of participation is critical, and the supply chains will be a key port, key port, key component to help pull it through the system, if that makes sense. Because I'm sure that that uh, the, those relationships between the producer and the packer is going to want to say, my supply chain is certified. Yeah. With that, uh, we're going to need to wrap up and move to the next speaker again. Let's give Roger a round of applause. Thank we'll you. thank him.